from the world of politics. The longer this conflict goes on, uh, the more the Chinese people will be wondering what, uh, where its own government stands and why they are not trying to uh, bring a halt uh, to the suffering. To the world of business. Inflation's here. It's not entirely transitory. Uh, the Fed has to impose at least some level of pain. This is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. As we come to air, one of the big pieces of news in the markets is basically the yield on the U.S. Treasury. The twos and the tens were up more than nine basis points at one point today. And you can bet that the bond market has been looking carefully at the chair of the Federal Reserve, Jay Powell, as he addresses the NABE. That's coming up in about 30 minutes. We're bringing you that here on Bloomberg. In the meantime, there is another big story in Washington right now, and that is the confirmation hearings of Judge Kentanji Brown Jackson for the Supreme Court of the United States. And for a report on how that's going, we turn now to our Washington correspondent, Joe Matthew, host of Sound On weekdays on Bloomberg Radio. So, Joe, thanks so much for being up there on Capitol Hill for us. Uh, what's going on so far? Just gaveled into session these confirmation hearings, David, roughly an hour ago, started 11 o'clock uh, Washington, D.C. time. And today is really about the formalities, the opening remarks, the introductions for Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson and the 22 members of this committee judiciary who will each get 10 minutes to make opening remarks. So it's going to last the bulk of the day, including, by the way, opening remarks from the judge herself, which you will hear and see live on Bloomberg TV and radio. We expect that a couple of hours from now. Tomorrow Tomorrow is when things will start to get a little more dicey. And based on what we already heard from Senator uh, uh, Lindsey Graham of South Carolina, there could be some very tough questions uh, for this nominee, specifically from Republican senators like Josh Hawley, Tom Cotton, Ted Cruz, who are expected to be running for president, never mind the aforementioned Lindsey Graham, who have sort of framed her as being soft on crime, David. This is something that we expect to hear quite a bit about, remembering that Democrats can confirm Judge Jackson if they stay together all on a party line vote. Now, this is not the only business happening today in the Senate. We've got four days of hearings here, but there's also work being done down the hall, if you will, in the Senate with reports that we could be on the verge of a deal, David, on sanctions against Russia that would ban Russian oil and gas, which the House has already done. An announcement on those sanctions could coincide with President Biden's trip to Europe, now adding Poland to the list, Brussels and Poland, by the end of this week, David. Yeah, which we'll be covering toward the end of the week. So, Joe, let me ask you one more question about Ukraine, if I could. Apart from yeah. sanctions, is there any move afoot for even further assistance to Ukraine? Well, that's interesting you ask that because uh, we just saw a bill passed here on, in Congress with some $14 billion. That was framed as a down payment David, so yes, with regard to military hardware and humanitarian assistance, you can expect a lot more to be coming from Washington. Okay, Joe, thanks so very much for that report from Capitol Hill. That's Bloomberg's Joe Matthew. And you can hear Joe this afternoon on Sound On on Bloomberg Radio. That's at 5 p.m. Eastern time. In the meantime, let's go to Ukraine and what's going on on the ground over there. Over the weekend, we heard from the Secretary General of the uh, NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, who warned about the possibility of chemical or biological weapons being used. We know that Russia has used chemical agents uh, mm -hmm. uh, in uh, Europe before against uh, their own uh, political uh, opponents, uh, right. and we, they, Russia has been um, um, facilitating, supporting the Assad regime in Syria, where uh, chemical weapons uh, has been uh, used. So this is something we take extremely serious. We welcome now a true expert on warfare, and particularly in Europe, Ben Hodges, is retired lieutenant general in the U.S. Army. He was a former commanding general, U.S. Army Europe. He is now Pershing chair in strategic studies at the Center for European Policy Anal Analysis. So, General, thank you so much for being with us. We heard it over the weekend that perhaps the Russians are stalled, which might drive them to use more extreme weapons. What is the situation on the ground over there, as best you understand it right now? Uh, David, I, I believe we are in the decisive phase of this campaign. Uh, this week, especially, and, and on in, a little bit into next week, uh, I believe that Russian forces are going to culminate, which means that they are no longer going to have the ability to sustain offensive operations. And I, and I base that on the manpower shortages and problems they're having, the enormous consumption of ammunition uh, that they have already done uh, and experienced, and they can't sustain that forever. 
Uh, and also, the, of course, the growing impressive defense and reaction of Ukrainian forces. So this is a chance here over the next several days uh, for the, the tide to really turn. But it is contingent on us uh, doing everything that we can faster to get them the capabilities they need. Something on the scale of the Berlin airlift with this kind of a um, sense of urgency uh, that that really needs to happen starting right now. So, General, that's something I'm really interested in, our capability of uh, supplying and resupplying the Ukrainian forces over there. You mentioned the Berlin airlift. It had a critical word in there, air. I'm not sure that we can go in and fly in the, the, the material that they need, the weapons they need. Are we confident we can keep supplying them on the ground? Yes, we can. Of course, uh, the, the Pentagon has been careful to avoid describing in too much detail how this is being done because they don't want to uh, enable the Russians to, to be able to target it uh, too effectively. But also, there are no U.S. troops or other NATO troops that are going into Ukraine. So there's a variety of means, including air, where uh, ammunition, weapons, medical supplies are being brought into Ukraine, into the Ukrainian distribution network from a variety of different places. What And of course, there's nobody in the world that does logistics better than the U.S. Air Force and the U.S. Army, but it takes us a little time to get it going. And my sense to here over the next three to four days, it's going to really pick up. But there's got to be, uh, what we need to hear from the president is that, look, this is about democracy versus autocracy, and we are the arsenal of democracy, just like FDR said. And we got to get serious about it. And I think there's been too much hesitancy about handing over certain things, we, we need we need to take our pedal, put our pedal to the metal, <laughs> and really provide them what they need. What do they need most of all? I mean, we've heard about S three hundreds, we've heard about sticker st stingers, various uh, shoulder held missiles. What is the thing they need the most? I believe that, and what I get from my Ukrainian friends who are uh, very clear about the requirements they have, they need to stop what's causing all the damage in cities, and this is cruise missiles being fired from Russian Navy ships, uh, cruise missiles, rockets, and artillery being fired from ground systems inside Ukraine and inside Russia. So we can provide the intelligence of point of origin, and we need to provide the ability to strike, to, to hit, sink a couple of those Russian ships, to, to knock out these rocket launchers and cruise missile launchers uh, with systems that they already know how to use. Or and I really was happy to see this, the announcement of 100 of these so-called switchblade drones. These are small drones that fly themselves into the target. Uh, but we need about 1,000 of them, not, not just 100. Uh, this is the kind of weapon system that can really take the pain uh, or uh, degrade the ability of Russians to keep murdering innocent Ukrainians. Air defense, for sure. But even the Russian Air Force tries to stay out of Russian of uh, Ukrainian airspace right now. So being able to shoot down drones and the occasional Russian aircraft is also important. General, many of us uh, were have been surprised by the Russians' inability to really execute this war in a more effective way. But it does raise the question we just heard from Jens Stoltenberg from NATO. Uh, if Putin really feels cornered, how concerned are we about chemical, biological, and yes, even tactical nuclear weapons? Well, Secretary General Stoltenberg is exactly right that the Russians have already used chemical weapons against their own people. Um, and they did support the Assad regime, which put three million refugees on the road into Europe that changed the political landscape of Europe for decades. So uh, I, I believe he has it in himself to do it, but I'm not sure he will do it. Um, first of all, the what's the tactical benefit? I mean, the, uh, the most likely... Uh, chemical weapon that would be used, I believe, is probably chlorine or ammonia, something like that. It's terrible for young people and older people. It will kill people, but not to the extent that, say, a uh, nerve agent would. And so the casualty producing effect won't be much more than what they can already do, but it will put things in a different category. And so I think the Russians have got to be, people around Putin have got to be saying, what benefit would we have from using chemical weapons? It, it won't change the outcome of anything. And I think people sitting around that long table are thinking, okay, we can see how this is going. I mean, this is there are no positive outcomes for Russia in the current situation, zero. And so people are going to start thinking, where do I want to be when Putin is gone? 
or this finally comes to a halt of some sort. And so I think there's going to be um, resistance to using chemical or nuclear weapons. I could be proven wrong tomorrow, uh, but my sense is that they're unlikely to do that. Fascinating. Thank you so very much. That's Lut retired Lieutenant General Ben Hodges. Coming up, GM starts productions of its all-electric SUV. It's called the Lyric. We talk with GM President Mark Royce. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Now we want to keep you up to date with news from all around the world. For that, we turn to Mark Crumpton with First Word. David, thank you. A Boeing 737-800 passenger jet has crashed in a mountainous area of southwestern China. The China Eastern Airlines flight was carrying 132 people. There has been no word yet on casualties. Officials say parts of the wreckage have been found. China Eastern says it will ground all of its Boeing 737-800 jets starting Tuesday. Some Baltic countries are urging the European Union to step up the pressure on Russia to end its invasion of Ukraine. Latvia's defense minister, Artis Fabris, told Bloomberg's Maria Today on Brussels today, Europe should not be afraid of being provocative when it comes to Russia. Kremlin thinking about provocation is very simple. If they will be willing to do, they will always find an excuse to tell that this was a provocation. So that's not important. I think we simply should look into the eyes of uh, Kremlin leaders and say, now you committed a crime, you committed aggression, now we will act. Mr. Fabrix is also calling for a fast-track approach to Ukraine's attempt at membership in the European Union. Senate confirmation hearings are underway for U.S. Supreme Court nominee Katanji Brown Jackson. The 51-year-old federal judge is hoping to become the first black woman to serve on the high court. Unless a major problem develops, the Democrats' narrow control of the Senate means confirmation is all but assured. In Texas, firefighters are still battling the largest wildfires in state history, but violent thunderstorms set to sweep through the region today may offer some help controlling the blazes. Cities including Houston, Dallas, Austin, and Arlington could be hit by heavy downpours, fierce winds, and dangerous hail. Forecasters say tornadoes also are possible. The blazes erupted last week and prompted the evacuations of hundreds of homes. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg. David? Thank you so much, Mark. Well, today, GM rolled the first of its all-electric SUVs. It's called the Cadillac Lyric off the assembly line in Spring Hill, Tennessee. We talked earlier today with GM President Mark Royce about how the Lyric fits into GM's ambitious EV plans overall and how the war in Ukraine may affect those plans. Four things here that I want to want to take away here for what we're doing. Number one, you know, uh, we're doing GM, General Motors and Cadillac are doing EVs fast and you know high demand car behind me here the lyric we moved it ahead nine months so we're, we're going into production here very excited about it number two um, you know we really have uh, Ultium as a differentiator here we've spent 4.3 billion dollars in this plant uh, to do both the assembly side of it and the Ultium cell site which is uh, right out back being built and you know the Ultium platform is really uh, modular it's a dedicated platform it can do everything from you know a uh, our Hummer that we're now producing to the Lyric to the Equinox to even lower roof vehicles and everything in between. So we're very agile. We spent the time and money to do our dedicated platforms. Huge differentiator for us. And then finally, the Cadillac piece of this, this is the first real pivot point for an all-electric Cadillac brand. So the Lyric is extremely important. Obviously, you've got some very ambitious plans at General Motors for electric vehicles. This is an important part of it. Can you give us a sense of how big a part of your overall EV plans this will be? I believe that by mid-decade, you said you wanted to do 2 million EVs, 1 million in the United States. How many of those do you expect will be Lyrics? Uh, we haven't gotten caught out with the, the volume projections here, but I can tell you we're bringing the whole uh, the whole Ultium cell production, Lordstown first, Spring Hill second, and then we go and we, as you know we've announced our Lansing Ultium plant, and uh, and so we're continually rolling up that production. But we haven't 
We haven't uh, given any volume predictions here on Lyric quite yet. This is a very special vehicle. It's going to be very high quality and uh, relatively high volume. So we know the interest is there. So we're doing everything we can uh, to get the raw materials and the supply chains in place, uh, which we have um, for things like nickel and lithium. And then we're moving um, into to launching the cell plant itself. So let's talk about the nickel, lithium, their various component parts, commodities. They're really under question right now. There already were issues with the commodities before the war in Ukraine. Now we have issues not only with nickel and neon, but also even, as I understand it, wire harnesses from Ukraine. How much will the war in Ukraine, you expect, affect your plans for Lyric and your larger plans for electric vehicles? That's a great, uh, great question, David. You know, I think, the, as you mentioned, the, the unfortunate um, circumstance of the war has uh, sh shown a light on, on some of those things. But, you know, we've been around for a while. And so, you know, we, we are not one dimensional on our supply chain. Our suppliers are, are one of our, our best resources. You know, I've got over 20,000 suppliers here in General Motors, moving about $88 billion worth of materials. So we're not new to this game. Um, we have great people. We've got great suppliers. And so we work hard on that every single day, regardless of whether the, what the geopolitical condition is. So, you know, it's, it's never over. Uh, it's never safe. It's never complete. So we work on that every single day. Uh, so, so, Mark, what is it doing to the input prices on things like, for example, nickel, which we saw shoot up? We've heard some electric vehicle manufacturers say that some of the prices are just ridiculous at the price. Is it affecting the prices that you're going to have to pay and therefore ultimately perhaps the price of a car like the Lyric? Well, I think, uh, David, if you look at those, uh, uh, those, those rare earth materials, they're not bought on a daily basis. They're bought on a, you know, projected supply and demand basis, you know, uh, years and, and sometimes months and years ahead of time. And so when we look at those, we try to secure those for the next, um, you know, five plus years. So uh, you may not see it today. You may not see it tomorrow. But those price fluctuations, you know, uh, are, are, are there. Uh, because of some of the things that are happening in the world today. But you know, we try to have those contracts and our suppliers on a long-term basis. Um, we, we always have. So, you know, I think it, uh, it's a little different than gas prices, um, which, you know, are a little more episodic um, in nature when you look at the price of crude oil. Are there particular inputs that you're concerned about, particular rare earths or others that you're most worried about? Uh, I think uh, we're worried about all of them, but you know, I think um, the, the nice thing is we have our, our battery chemistry is vertically integrated in General Motors, so we can do very, very quick turns um, and be very agile with um, actually making coupons of our cells on site in Warren, Michigan, testing those, going back and forth on the anode and cathode, and you know, for instance, we've reduced the amount of cobalt uh, by 70 percent here um, from from the previous gen uh, chemistry. So, I think there's a combination of things that we're doing to. Uh, get out of using uh, as, as many of those rare materials are that we're doing in, uh, today in typical lithium uh, 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 configuration for ourselves. But um, I think, you know, everything is, is, is really being looked at with under a microscope right now. I'm not sure there's one of those that stands out to answer your question, um, but we're worried about all of those, and we should be. Uh, you, you have to really be looking at that every day on all fronts. Uh, it's not just uh, commodity prices such as nickel or neon and things that are going up. It's also the price of oil and the price of gas. Uh, are you seeing that reflect in some of the demand for electric vehicles? You said that you sold out already on the Lyric. What sort of level of demand are you seeing, and, and specifically in, like, reservations? I think, um, well, our reservations open on May 19th, so I'll have a better idea um, of what the actual reservations are, which I think is the real telltale on it. But we've got over 200,000 people that saw the car for the first time that are, that are interested in it under our website and are waiting for those reservations to open. So um, it's a very exciting time for us. Uh, the, the gas prices, I think we're always cautiously uh, watching that. You know, is the gas price situation today an accelerant? Um, it may be an accelerant in interest, but you never want to look at, um, I don't think, gas prices as, as, you know, an episodic change in those never really manifests itself into a long-term uh, purchase decision because cars are, you know, those are a big part of everybody's life and um, cost, you know, biggest investment for a lot of people uh, other than their house, so uh, second only to their house. So they have to be come up and, and have a sustained level of that to see the actual adoption as people get in and out of cars. But I would say the interest in EVs is definitely spiking because of some of the, the gas prices we've seen over the last three weeks.
That was GM President Mark Royce. Still to come here, Fed Chair Jay Powell will speak to the NABE meeting in Washington. We're going to bring you that live. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. I said at the top of the program that I thought that the yields on Treasuries were really the story today. Now we're going to find out whether I was right. And Kriti Gupta is here to tell us. Kriti? You're 100% <laughs> right. You're always right. Yeah. I mean, listen, the bond market is going kind of crazy right now because they're trying to price in uh, the seven rate hikes, I believe, is what is priced into the market. But they're also trying to price in when that's going to get reversed. So they're trying to price in when growth is going to accelerate and when, dare I say it, we're going to plunge into a recession. And it's that kind of tug of war that you're seeing super strong growth versus essentially a plunging of growth. And those that's the tug of war that you're seeing in the bond market to the point where they're pricing in or you're starting to see an inversion of the belly of the curve. So your sevens, your fives, your threes, but you're not seeing it in your more vanilla spreads like your twos tens curve. For yeah, but the example. twos tens is down around 20 basis points at this point, isn't it? It's very, pretty narrow. It's pretty narrow, but it's not inverted yet. No, it's and that's not. the one we're waiting for to kind of see is that the recession indicator. Um, but also something to keep in mind is just because you see, say, the belly of the curve invert, or should I say even the twos tens invert, notice that this is actually a pretty normal reaction when you are trying to price in such an aggressive rate hike, but then a very quick policy reversal. This is the kind of move you're going to see, and that doesn't necessarily mean a recession is going to happen. Yes, history suggests that they have coincided in the past, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's all doom and gloom from here. Okay, let me push you. What's going on with equities then? I mean, equities are around flat, up a little, down a little. They're not really reacting to this jump up in the in the yield. No, they're not at all. And, and remember, this is coming off last week where you saw this major bounce. So one of the questions here is, is that kind of bounce that we saw last week really sustainable in the face of higher oil prices, which, by the way, are much, much higher today. And that's going to be the correlation that you really want to keep an eye on. I don't have a straight answer for you about what's going on with the equity market, but what I am noticing is that you are seeing green on the screen, even a little bit of marginal green for the stock market in the same time that you're seeing oil prices higher. And that's a dynamic we haven't seen really show up in all of 2022. It's been higher oil prices, stocks lower in response. That's interesting. You wonder whether the stocks are getting a little bit uh, inured to higher oil prices, perhaps. Yeah, I think there is a little bit of this kind of numbness almost yeah. to the geopolitical tensions. A lot of the focus really coming back down to the Fed. Great. Thank you so much, Kriti. Great to have you here. That's Kriti Gupta with the report on the markets. Coming up, we're going to have Fed Chair Jay Powell with his remarks to the National Association of Broadcast Economists. We'll see exactly what the markets make of what he has to say in the wake of what happened to Fed yes last week. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on Bloomberg Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We are waiting right now for the remarks from the chairman of the Fed. He is Jay Powell, and he's going to be appearing before the National Association of Business Economics down in Washington, D.C. We already heard from the chair last week, but there are a lot of interest, actually, in what he had to say and how he might be a little bit different in his spin now. A lot of questions being raised about what Chair Powell had to say last week, and the markets, of course, have reacted. And for a reaction immediately, we now go to our colleague Michael McKee in Washington. He's our Bloomberg International Economics and Policy Correspondent. So, Mike, give us a sense of what we think Jay Powell is going to say. Well, the chairman wants to reassure the markets that things are going to be all right. There's been a lot of volatility since the last time he spoke, especially in the oil markets. And calming that down would help the Fed out a lot, particularly with the idea of keeping the uh, yield curve from inverting and keeping interest rates from going too high as traders try to price in a premium. Uh, fascinating. So there's a lot of questions about the economic projections that were made in, in what we heard last week. Uh, do we think that he's going to clarify that? Uh, I don't know if he's going to clarify it, uh, but I think he will probably explain why he thinks the Fed is going to be able to get where it wants to go. Remember, uh, they're predicting that inflation is going to come down and unemployment is not going to rise. And there are a lot of people who say, uh, wait a minute. <laughs> 
How does that work? And so uh, the Fed is going to be looking forward to uh, what they can do to try to ensure that they meet their goals, they meet their efforts. Now, the headlines are out now from Jay Powell's speech. And uh, what the chairman is saying, he's got a sort of a uh, four-part uh, message to the markets today. Uh, one is that the labor market is very strong, but inflation is too high. It accelerated suddenly and took everybody, including the Fed, by surprise. It wasn't going up very rapidly until after September, and it's really moved since we got to the turn of the year. He predicts it will go down to around 2 percent, but it's going to take three years to do that. Ukraine is creating tremendous uncertainty. We heard that from Rafael Bostic this morning. And he does say the Fed can tame inflation without recession. But his message to the markets overall is, we will do what is necessary. Here's the key quote from Jay Powell today. We will take the necessary steps to ensure a return to price stability. In particular, if we conclude it is appropriate to move more aggressively by raising the federal funds rate by more than 25 basis points at a meeting or meetings, we will do that. And if we determine we need to tighten beyond common measures of neutral and into a more restrictive stance, we will do that as well. So Powell letting the markets, letting the world know the Fed is determined to take action against inflation thinks it can do that. And uh, they are relatively confident at the moment that they can. Well, one of the things that strikes me, Mike, and I know what it does is you, uh, it's not just bringing it down to 2%, but it's going to have to take some real uh, action to get that done. Do we have a sense of what the common sense of neutral, were those are the words that the chair used, what that is? Well, if you look at the Fed's forecast, it's about 2.4 percent, but the estimates vary widely. Uh, some people think it's as high as 3, maybe even 4 percent. The Fed's going to have to feel its way along. And for that, I go back to Rafael Bostic, the Atlanta Fed president, who spoke this morning and said every meeting is going to have to be sort of a new meeting. They're going to have to look around and see where they are and what's happening in the world. A lot will depend on the price of oil. A lot will depend on the Ukraine war. And they can't really make a strong prediction. Uh, he said six moves, but that could easily change if, uh, if the circumstances change. So, so, Mike, come back to this neutral, wherever it is, because we don't know. Nobody, at least as I know, gives us a memo that says this is where neutral is. Does everyone, and by this I mean critically, the Federal Reserve and particularly the chair, agree you've got to go above and perhaps even significantly above whatever that neutral is in order to really bring inflation down the way they promise? Well, they're phrasing it a little bit differently. I think they agree probably most of them with uh, what you just said. But the general way they're talking about it now is we will if we have to. Uh, they don't want to suggest that they're going to tighten significantly because they don't want to throw the markets off and uh, perhaps cause a stock market reaction. But they want people to know that it is on the table if necessary. We've been talking a lot about uh, yields on treasuries today, and particularly the possibility of inversion, which we have now in what they call the belly of the curve. Uh, how much does the Fed focus on that question when they're asking the, themselves about a possibility of a recession? Generally, the Fed doesn't focus too much on it, and it depends on which curve you're looking at. For example, the three-month, 10-year steepened, and the 10-year note has uh, steepened today. Uh, so the Fed is kind of looking through that. Uh, the Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic said this morning that he thinks it's very heavily influenced by what's happening in Ukraine and with oil prices now, and the Fed can't make policy based on that. So they're going to look forward and, uh, and try to figure out where the economy is going to be without looking necessarily at the shape of the yield curve. Okay, Bloomberg's Michael McKee. Thank you so much. He's down in Washington for the NABE hearing. I'm sure he wants to go in to see. It's not just the remarks, but also there's going to be Q&A afterwards, as I understand it. Thank you so much, Mike. In the meantime, let's check out for any possible reaction from the markets to what we're hearing so far from these headlines out of Chair Jay Powell. And we'll turn back to Kriti Gupta now. Yeah, well, plenty of market reaction here. Essentially, the takeaway is that Chairman Powell has said the Fed can be far more aggressive if it really needs to, of course, in response, citing some of those c concerns uh, from the Russian invasion and the read through from that. So immediately, the reaction that you're seeing here is you are seeing yields spike across the curve from the two year all the way to the 10 year. And you're seeing a lot of the belly of the curve that you were just talking about actually go further into negative territory. So once again, it prices in even more so than we saw this morning, the idea that the Fed can 
can actually make an even more hawkish pivot. But on the back of that, markets also pro pricing in the fact that they might have to quickly reverse that. In other words, pricing in that slowdown that could be accelerated. There's also, as I read the Bloomberg here, uh, a change from when we talked about this just a few minutes ago, and that is we had the yield spiking up, they've gone even higher now. But in equities, when we talked earlier, they were flatter even a little bit to the green. Yeah. It looks to me like they've gone all gone red on us now. Immediately taking that reaction here, and I think this is almost healthy a little bit because you are seeing uh, the stock market talk to uh, the fact that they need that stimulus. You are seeing them respond to the Fed a little bit more. That twenty, that aggressive hawkish kind of pivot isn't necessarily all priced in. And it's really, I think, this headline that's spooking perhaps the stock market a little bit more, saying that the Fed will hike by more than 25 basis points each time if needed. This is an important piece of the equation because something new that's been introduced to the conversation is simply that a 50 basis point hike is on the table, but it's not just a one-time thing. The, the Fed can very much use it over and over again and hike by that margin. And that's something that hasn't really brought been brought into the conversation before. And that's something that stock market would be far more sensitive to. But also take a look at these moves. The S&P 500 only down four tenths of a percent on the back of that headline. We've seen bigger moves off spikes in oil. So at the meantime, let me ask you about VIX. You may not have gotten a chance to look at it, but I just look at it. It's at 24. It's up, but only a very small amount. It doesn't look like the VIX yet is moving a lot. No, it's not. Um, you know what's interesting about the VIX is that in the face of the Russian tensions, of the geopolitical uh, tensions going on over there in that part of the world, the new kind of normal has become a 30 handle on the VIX. Going into 2021, post-pandemic, the new normal was 20. So to see the VIX kind of come back down, really as a, lar as a result of last week's gains, come down to a 24 handle is pretty good. But it's the same question you're going to see across yields, across the stock market, across the reduced volatility in the commodities market. Does it stay below that 25 handle? If it gets back to 20, that's really good news for investors who've kind of been thrown around by the Russian invasion. Has there been a pattern about retail versus institutional? And sometimes you see that in sort of smart money, dumb money, as they call it, right? Depending on yeah. when the moves really happen, when in the day they do, will they happen overnight, will they happen first thing in the morning, will they happen right at the very end? Well, the institutional money has been making the moves overnight, and that's yeah. really where you're seeing a lot of the funds enter and exit the the U.S. exchanges, as specifically, specifically, excuse me, when it comes to the tech space in particular. Retail, on the other hand, I believe if you track some of their flows, has consistently been buying even in the face of this really aggressive correction. You have seen a 15% drop intraday from the peak of the S&P 500 to the trough. So retail has been trying to buy, but you're not seeing that same conviction, that same volume of buying that you did perhaps perhaps a year ago. And that's really where you can see institutional traders driving uh, the trade on this. And finally, Kriti, just to put this in a bit broader perspective, we had a big rally in equities last week. It felt, felt good. But if you look at 2022, going back to January 1, it's not as pretty a picture. It's really not as pretty of a picture. And I think what's important to keep in mind uh, when you kind of go moving forward is that there's a lot of people who want to buy this bounce right now. And that's mm. really what they're trying to do. But they're trying to find a way to do it that makes sense in the context of the worst shocks that could come uh, from the commodity space. This isn't about bond yields anymore. This isn't arguably about the Fed anymore. It's all going to be in response to Russia. And that might as well just be, can you read Vladimir Putin's mind? And I don't think anyone can. By the way, you had Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley come out today with a note saying, don't buy this. <laughs> don't buy this. Yes, talking very strongly about bear market rallies. Exactly right, bear market rallies. Thank you so much, Kriti. Really great job on the markets with Kriti Gupta. In the meantime, we want to go back to Washington right now because there's another aspect of this, really. We're about to hear from Fed Chair Jay Powell before the NABE. But we have to remember, he has not been confirmed for his second term as chair. That's still pending before the Senate Banking Committee. And for a report on where that stands, we welcome now Emily Wilkins of Bloomberg Government. So, Emily, thanks so much for being with us. Bring us up to date. We've almost forgotten about where that ended up with the five nominees. Now there are four. It's a little bit like a 10 Little Indians, right? I mean, yes, the nominations, they were going to move in a bulk, and then it got delayed because Republicans had concerns about Sarah Bloom Raskin. It would have been fine if Democrats had all stuck together, but Senator Joe Manchin also said that he had concerns, that he couldn't support her, and that meant that there wasn't a chance for her nomination to pass. So we've seen the Senate Banking Commission go ahead and vote to clear Powell, as well as Lael Brainerd and another Fed nominee. Uh, they also did a tie on Lisa Cook, and so she will actually 
actually be able to move out of the committee as long as Democrats can stick together on that. So now all that's need to, needed to be done is that the Senate needs to have a vote on the nominees. And Powell is almost at this point guaranteed to pass. He got bipartisan support from the committee. He got a mark of confidence from Democrats as well as Republicans. In fact, the only person to vote against him in the committee was Senator Elizabeth Warren. Uh, so you can definitely see a lot of bipartisan support there, uh, a high likelihood that whenever that vote does manage to come to the Senate floor, uh, that Powell will be renominated as, or reconfirmed rather, as the next Fed chair. Emily, you understand the workings of the House and the Senate, but the Senate for this purpose is so much better than I do. Give me a sense of where we are with um, uh, Dr. Cook. Is it more complicated to get that to the floor than for the other three remaining nominees? Well, Cook has some of the same issues that Sarah Bloom Raskin had. Republicans sort of targeted her background, looking at racial inequalities in economics, and said that they were worried that she was going to try and use her position on the Fed to enact policy. Now, of course, Cook has said that that was never her intention, and she seems at this point to have enough support to actually make it to the floor. So as long as Democrats stick together, they'll have to do an additional vote to get her nomination formally out of the committee, because it was a tie, 12-12. Uh, but then once that happens, as long as Manchin's on board and we haven't seen any sign that he isn't, she will be able to get confirmed with Democrats only. For our TV and radio audiences, we're keeping an eye on Washington, that NABE meeting right now. I believe we're having the introduction of Chair Jay Powell. We will bring you that as soon as he comes to the podium and begins to speak. In the meantime, I'm going to put you on the spot the way I always do. Unfair question. When will we get a vote on these four remaining nominees? You know, David, I was trying to find that before coming on. I'm like, this is the news I want to break to everyone. At this point, it's not clear. The Senate is in this week, so there is a chance that they could wind up taking up that nomination, of all those four nominations, rather. Uh, but at this point, we just don't have anything on the calendar. And part of the complicating factor is that you are going to need the 51 votes to get Lisa Cook out of the uh, committee and onto the Senate floor. That means that Vice President Kamala Harris is going to need to make a trip to the Senate to do that. Uh, so uh, from your experience up there in the Senate, are we learning more about the Fed nominees and the Federal Reserve, or are we learning more about uh, the senators and elections coming up in the fall? I mean, it's a little bit of both, right? I think that we're looking at, when you talk to lawmakers, when you see what their concerns are, it's a question of what is this Fed going to be used for? Is politics creeping into the Fed? And are some of these nominees going to try to use the Fed to further policy as far as climate, as far as race? I mean, these are things that we already know are very important to the Biden administration. And I think there's just a concern, particularly on the Republican side, that the Fed remains as neutral as possible. And I think this kind of ties into a larger conversation about the partisanship that we're seeing in Washington. Uh, certainly, we're also having Supreme Court hearings today, and that's another body where there's a lot of concern on both sides that's become more and more political okay. and less and less neutral. Emily, I'm going to cut you off. Thank you so much. That was so terribly helpful because we see that, in fact, the chair of the Federal Reserve is about to step to the podium and begin his remarks to the National Association of Business e Economics. Opportunity to speak here today. It's great to be back at NABE, and it's great to see so many familiar faces around the room. Um, let me first pause uh, to recognize the many millions who are suffering the tragic consequences of Russia's invasion of Ukraine today. At the Federal Reserve, our monetary policy is guided by the dual mandate to promote maximum employment and stable prices. From that standpoint, the current picture is plain to see. The labor market is very strong and inflation is much too high. My colleagues and I are acutely aware that inflation imposes significant hardship, especially on those least able to meet the higher costs of essentials, like food, housing, and transportation. There is an obvious need to move expeditiously to return the stance of monetary policy to a more neutral level, and then to move to more restrictive levels, if that is what is required to restore price stability. We are committed to restoring price stability while preserving a strong labor market. At our meeting that concluded last week, we took several steps in pursuit of these goals. We raised our policy interest rate for the first time since the start of the pandemic and said that we anticipate that ongoing rate increases will be appropriate to reach our objectives. We also said that we expect to begin reducing the size of our balance sheet at a coming meeting. In the press conference after the meeting, I noted that action could, could come as soon as our next meeting in May, though that is not a decision that we've made. 
These actions, along with the adjustments we have made since last fall, represent a substantial firming in the stance of policy with the intention of restoring price stability. In my comments today, I will first discuss the economic conditions that warrant these actions and then address the path ahead for monetary policy. To begin with employment, in the last few years of the historically long expansion that ended with the arrival of the pandemic, we saw the remarkable benefits of an extended period of strong labor market conditions. We seek to foster another long expansion in order to realize those benefits again. The labor market has substantial momentum, employment growth powered through the difficult Omicron wave, adding 1.75 million jobs over the past three months. The unemployment rate has fallen to 3.8% near historical lows and has reached this level much faster than anticipated by most forecasters. While disparities in employment remain, job growth has been widespread across racial, ethnic, and demographic groups. By many measures, the labor market is extremely tight, significantly tighter than the very strong job market just before the pandemic. There are far more job openings going unfilled today than before the pandemic, despite today's unemployment rate being higher. Indeed, there are a record 1.7 posted job openings for each person who is looking for work. Record numbers of people are quitting jobs each month, typically to take another job with higher pay. Nominal wages are rising at the fastest pace in decades, with the gains strongest for those at the lower end of the wage distribution and among production and non-supervisory workers. It's worth considering why the labor market is so tight, given that the unemployment rate is actually higher than it was before the pandemic. One explanation is that the natural rate of unemployment may be temporarily elevated so that wage pressure is greater for any given, given level of unemployment. The sheer volume of hiring may have taxed the capacity of markets to bring jobs and workers together. The Delta and Omicron variants complicated hiring and the strong financial position of households may have allowed some to be more selective in their job search. Over time, we might expect these factors to fade, reducing pressure in the job market. A second source of labor market tightness is that the labor force participation rate dropped sharply in the pandemic and has only partly recovered. As a result, the labor force remains below its pre-pandemic trend. Total demand for labor measured by total employment plus posted job openings has substantially recovered and far exceeds the size of the workforce. About half of the shortfall in labor force participation is attributable to retirements during the pandemic. We have been listening, of course, to Fed Chair Jay Powell give his remarks to the National Associated Broadcast of, 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 of sorry, banking, of business economics, beg your pardon, uh, in Washington. Uh, he is addressing the strength of the labor market and what they have done thus far in monetary policy. Unfortunately, the audio quality is not what one would have liked. Uh, that particularly hurts us on radio, so we're going to jump out and see if we can get a better audio quality back. In the meantime, just to summarize a bit of what he said, he said that uh, they have moved uh, quickly to firm what he said, their policy, but they must move expeditiously to a neutral position and then, if necessary, he said, to restrictive a monetary policy. Uh, the labor market has made substantial momentum. Uh, he mo noted that the unemployment rate is now down to 3.8 percent, got there a lot faster than we thought. And although there are still some disparities in employment, uh, that it is a broad-based improvement that we are seeing. He also noticed the fact that, that actually, in some ways, this is a much tighter labor market than before the pandemic. He noted uh, one statistic, 1.7 job openings for every single person seeking a job. So it's a very tight labor market, as he said. But he admits that they need to move expeditiously he said that the inflation is significantly higher than it should be. They need to move expeditiously to get that down. In the meantime, let's go back now to Kriti Gupta, who covers all of our markets for us to give us a sense of what's happening in the markets. Kriti? Yeah, well, going into this conversation in particular, what was really important was simply the idea uh, that you did see um, a lot of people talking about what that actually meant for, in terms of the belly of the curve, what they were actually pricing in. Remember, they were pricing in multiple rate hikes, a very aggressive rate hike path. But what they weren't pricing in, which was extremely important, is the quick policy reversal, that they were going to have to backtrack at some point. And that's really where you're seeing some of the diversions in the belly of the curve here, the threes and the tens, the fives, tens, uh, the sevens, tens, for example. But you're not seeing it yet in the twos, tens. Here's why is that significant. 
we are going to a place where we have an extremely tight labor market, we have extreme inflation shocks, and the Federal Reserve essentially has to say, pick your poison. And that's what they're doing here. They're targeting inflation. And, and what's kind of scary for the markets here is that there doesn't seem to be a ton of room to wiggle from here. For example, if you started to see the... Uh, the inflation shocks, commodity shocks, essentially kind of plunge the economy into recession. This is a worst case scenario here. There isn't a ton of room at the moment for the Fed to say, you know what, we're going to cut rates, we're going to stimulate the economy again. And that is part of the reason why you're actually seeing this idea that they need to adjust and perhaps see a quicker policy reversal at the end of the aggressive rate hike. Fascinating. Thank you so much, Kriti, for all your hard work today. Really appreciate it. It's Kriti Gupta on the markets. Coming up, we're going to have more on the market's reaction to Chair Powell. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. We've been closely following the Fed Chair Jay Powell's remarks before the National Association of Business Economics. There, I got it right. Down in Washington, D.C., as he continues to speak down there, talking about what they need to do to really move quickly to address the problem of inflation that he admits now is a big problem. We want to come back now to Kriti Gupta, who covers all of our markets for us. And Kriti, we've talked about equities. We've talked about bonds. Let's talk about uh, foreign exchange a little bit. Yeah, well, what's interesting to me here is that as you start to see yields rise, you're going to naturally see a bump in the dollar as well. That is simple interest rate differentials that you're going into. But something that isn't getting, I think, enough attention perhaps is the amount of pretty substantial gains you're seeing in commodity currency, specifically in emerging markets. So currencies like uh, the Brazilian real, for example, they are going to be getting a, a huge bid because a lot of these commodity exporting countries, they are suddenly in demand. So you do see the Brazilian real become this extreme kind of beacon of strength for anyone wanting that EM exposure if you don't want to go through the commodities market, which we know a lot of people are pulling out of just given the volatility. You've seen open interest, for example, in crude and other metals just kind of collapse, especially with the onset of the invasion. A lot of those monies, a lot of those flows are actually going into FX because you can do more with it. You don't necessarily have to pull out of some of these positions. And it's pretty clear that this commodity demand, whether you're an aluminum producer, an oil producer, a food producer, for example, that's not going anywhere anytime soon. So for a lot of EM countries or EM investors, the Brazilian real, the Mexican peso, this is kind of where they're parking some of their money. And yeah, it's going to affect a lot of economies as well, as they need to fill some of the gaps that are left behind in commodities. Thank you so much, Kriti. Really great job today covering the markets repeatedly for us throughout the hour. We want you to check out the Balance of Power newsletter on the terminal and online. In the meantime, we're going to have a second hour of Balance of Power over on radio. We'll do more in coverage of the, the remarks of Chair Jay Powell down at the NABE in Washington. We'll also get back to Russia, Ukraine. And this is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.